53 to the end of the chapter tonight. You know, that song is, it's more than a song to me. My hope is Jesus is my life. I have no other good outside of Christ. I have no other hope outside of Christ. Jesus is, is everything to me. He is he's my hope, he's my joy, he's my peace, and without him, I have absolutely nothing. Even if I have the entire world and I have no relationship with him, I have nothing. And tonight we're going to look at a passage, it might be a little surprising to you, um, how short this passage is, how general it is. A lot of people probably wouldn't zero in on just these few verses. Um, but I think you'll see why as I develop this text and, and really look at what's going on here. Um, how important it is. So look with me, Mark chapter 6, verse 53. This is um, a, an ordinary day in the life of Jesus and his healing ministry. Jesus performed miracles virtually every day in his three, three and a half year ministry. And what you see here is just this summary of what an ordinary day looked like in the, looked like in the life of Christ. But what I want you to wrestle with is really what the title of this message is, is what do you want from Jesus? What do you want from the Lord? Think about that as I read this passage of scripture. It says, when they had crossed over, they came to the land of Genesaret and moored to the shore. And when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized them and ran about the whole region and began to bring the sick, began to bring the sick people on their beds to wherever he heard, they heard he was. And wherever he came, in villages, cities, or countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it were made well. Let's pray. Lord, our hope is Jesus. Every man and woman in here, even if they don't acknowledge your name, he is their only hope. He's our only comfort and peace in life and death. And apart from him and his promises and his accomplishments, Lord, our life is not only meaningless, but it is hopeless. We're left in darkness. We're left in our sin. We're left underneath your judgment. And so tonight I want to pray you'd open eyes to see what a beautiful treasure Christ is. And I pray that as we leave here tonight, we would have a deeper understanding and appreciation and and desire to want the giver of life over his gifts. That we would see that the greatest gift is Jesus himself. We pray in his name. Amen. A couple of weeks ago, our church put on a conference in Ashland, North Carolina. It was called uh, ETC, Engaging Truth Conference. It was for middle school, high school students, and we're just trying to teach them how to stand firm on biblical truth in a culture that's just wavering and really going at their faith at every single angle. One of the speakers we had at the conference is a man named by John Piper. Um, You may or may not have heard that name, but it's kind of a big name in Christianity. If if you're a sports fan, he'd be kind of the Michael Jordan of Christianity, if you will. He's one of the most famous speakers, authors, uh, teachers of our time. His name will be remembered for a long time, and he spoke at our conference, and it was a huge honor for us. And any time Pastor John speaks, no matter where he goes in the country, in the world, when he gets done preaching, people line up to talk to him. They'll, he'll spend 20, 30, 40 minutes just talking to person after person after person, and it's, a, it's really a cool opportunity to talk to him. And they want to talk to him and tell him how much their, his ministry is meant to them, or they want to ask him some big question. It's one of the two. And it was just, it was kind of comical because after his Q&A session, people are lining up to talk to Pastor John. And I had the privilege because he was connected to our church and we were running the event. I had the privilege of taking him everywhere and I was really there to provide whatever he needed. And so I asked him, I said, how long do you want to spend talking to people after this event? I'll come tap you on the shoulder and say, we got to go. And he said, well, we don't have anything to do after this. I'll talk as long as people want to talk. I said, that's fine. And so he was talking one after another, and the room started getting thinner and thinner. and got down to the last group of people, and here, here's this girl coming up to John Piper. This is probably the only time that she'll get a chance to meet him. And she has one opportunity to ask him whatever she wants. This man that has a wealth of knowledge and experience, and she comes up to him and says, Pastor John, I have a question for you. What's your favorite color? And I just thought, really? Like, that's your question? 
you have one opportunity to talk to this incredibly brilliant man, and your question is, what's your color? And it, it's funny because John said blue because that's God's favorite color. And he actually had theological reasons why blue is God's favorite color. Um, but I, had, I, just, I just was blown away because you have this one opportunity to talk to this man, and you use your opportunity on something superficial. It made me think of the passage that we are in tonight. Because if you know the context here, Jesus just fed the 5,000. We'll talk more about that in a moment. But he comes up to the shore. All these people see him coming. They go get crowds and their friends and their families and everyone they can think of that's got any kind of ailment at all from hangnails to terminal illnesses. They're bringing them to Jesus. And they have one opportunity to meet with the Son of God. And what do they ask for? Physical healing. They have one chance to stand face to face with God in the flesh. They can ask of him anything they want. And I'm not here to say that Jesus is, a, is some genie in a bottle and he'll grant them any wish they have. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that they had this one opportunity to stand before the Lord and to request of him anything that was on their heart. And what did these people want? They wanted their bodies healed. This man who has the power to grant them reconciliation with God, eternal life, forgiveness of sins, the hope of heaven, eternal joy. And what do they want? They want their back aches to go away. It made me just think in my mind, what do I want from the Lord? What do I truly want from him? And I'd be what I would ask you tonight is, what do you want from God? And here would be a good question is, why are you here tonight? Why would you come? Now, some of you might say, well, I had to come. It's part of my program. Others of you say, well, I want to be here to grow. Here would be a better question is, what do you want God to do for you? You have one request. If you have one opportunity to stand before God, what do you want from the Lord? That's the question I want you to think about tonight. Because I think if many of us were honest, we would probably be very much like these people in the text, and really, as just a kind of an illustration, we'd be like that little girl and just want to know what Jesus' favorite color is. When he offers you so much more. What I want you to understand before you leave here tonight is that what God has to offer you is the most important thing for us, and that is himself. God offers you God, the greatest treasure in the world. And he offers you God through Jesus. So let's think about that as we get into this passage of scripture, begin wrapping our minds around this. Over the last, in this passage, in this chapter, the last 24 hours in Jesus' life has been very busy. Remember just before this, it was the night before, right? He fed the 5,000 plus men, or plus women and children. So 15, 20,000 people, Jesus took a few pieces of fish and bread and multiplied it, miraculously fed all these people. And then after that, they wanted to make him king because they thought, well, this is a great opportunity to have this man rule over us if he can feed us and he can rule us this is a, a wonderful a wonderful benevolent ruler so they want to make him king but Jesus didn't want any part of that and what he did was he sent his disciples away remember that he sends his disciples away in the boat while he dismisses the crowd Jesus then goes up on the mountain to pray and the disciples find themselves in a terrible windstorm and in the windstorm is when Jesus then descends the mountain and walks on the water he walks on the sea. And the reason he did this, we discovered, was he's revealing who he is in the midst of their trial. In their difficult circumstances, Christ reveals his divine nature so that they will trust in him. Well, then Jesus gets into the boat, and now it's the next day. All that took place in the early morning hours, and now it is the next day. And that's where our passage picks up. Look at verse 53 with me again. It says, when they had crossed over, so when they crossed over the Sea of Galilee, they came to the land of Gennesaret and moored, that word moored means anchored, they anchored to the shore. So their boat hit the shore, they anchored down, and now they're in the land of Gennesaret. If you remember back in chapter 5, verses 1 through 20, this is the same land where Jesus healed that demon-possessed man who was super crazy. Remember him? Remember the guy that lived in the tombs? And he was demon-possessed, he cut himself, he cried out all day and night, he was tormented, he was terrifying to the people where he lived. And so they chained him up because they didn't want him as a part of their society. 
but he broke the chains because he had supernatural strength. And when he saw Jesus, he ran towards Jesus, and Jesus healed the man, restored his mind. That man wanted to go with Jesus. Remember, he wanted to go with Jesus in the boat and keep going on his ministry with him. But what did Jesus say? No, go home, go to your country, and tell them how much the Lord has done for you. Well, all that has been taking place since then. So this land of Genesaret, they have this witness, this missionary who is healed of his demonic possession, and he's been telling everybody about Jesus. And so when they see Jesus coming, well, look at verse 54. It says, when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him. Well, I'm sure they did, because this is the man they've heard about. This is the man that they know restored this individual in their community, and this is the man that has been going all around Israel healing diseases. They know people who had terminal illnesses or paralysis or you name it, fill in the blank, and now they're well. And they say, well, how are you now not sick anymore? And they say, I, I met this guy, Jesus. How do you not have leprosy all over your skin anymore? How are you looking normal? Well, I met this guy, Jesus, and he made me clean. Why are you not bedridden anymore? Last time I saw you, you couldn't even speak. You, could, you, were, you were comatose, and now you're up and you're well and you're strong. How did this happen? I don't know. They told me Jesus came by. And so they have heard about this man who heals all diseases. And so when they see him, they immediately know who it is. And look what happens in verse 55. It says they ran about the whole region. And began to bring the sick people on their beds to wherever they heard he was. When they see Jesus coming ashore, I mean, it's the most incredible moment of their lives. They start going into the towns, into the villages, into the cities, and spreading the word. Hey, hey, y'all, Jesus is coming. Get your sick. Bring your dead. Bring whoever is not, it doesn't matter if they have a cough or if they have cancer. Bring all to Jesus because he can heal them. And so people are coming in droves. They're coming in crowds to see the Lord. I mean, can you imagine if you heard that over on, on, on 40 and 109, where it intersects there, there was a man standing on the bridge, and he had the ability to heal anybody. Can you imagine the crowds that would be over there? Can you imagine how many people would be, I mean, there would be chaos. Of all the sick people, I mean, even with the hospital, I mean, they didn't have hospitals back then, guys. If you were sick, you stayed sick. There was virtually, medicine was virtually non-existent. We can imagine what it would be like today. Imagine what it was like then. I saw this movie several years ago. It was called Elysium. I don't know if you guys have ever seen that movie. Matt Damon. Not a bad movie. But it's, the whole premise of the movie is that on earth, it's a wasteland. People are sick. It's a nasty place. But then up in outer space, there's, this, there's this, new, this new place that they've created in this uh, environment where people not only live really good lives, they have these beds where if you're sick, you can get into these beds and it heals all of your diseases. But the people in outer space wouldn't let the people on earth have them. But then at the end of the movie, they take four by force, take them, and they bring these healing beds to the earth, and they just start lining people up so they can become well. And that's a movie. Imagine what they did when Jesus was on the scene. They're just bringing forth everybody. Just, just let me touch the fringe of his garments. They're begging for healing. And look, look at verse 56. He healed everybody. And wherever he came, in villages, in cities, the countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment. And as many touched it were made well fringe of his garment. Where did they get that idea? Remember the woman back in chapter 5 who was bleeding for 12 years? Jesus walking through a crowd and she thought to herself, if I can just touch him. She gets up behind him just touches his clothing and she's healed. And so reports about that spread everywhere. All you got to do is touch this guy. Like listen, just go up, touch his clothing, go home. You'll be fine. And so that's what they want. If we can just touch him. And so everyone, everyone that came to Jesus got healed. And here's why this is important. I don't know if you've ever turned on television and you saw these faith healers. Maybe you've gotten on YouTube and go, go Google Benny Hinn. And you'll see this guy dressed up in this white outfit. And he's in these healing miracle crusades where he's bringing people on stage. And he's declaring healing over people and 
you know, people that have headaches and back aches and can't hear or can't see, all these diseases that can't be verified or falsified, you know? There's a man named Justin Peters who is born with cerebral palsy, and uh, if you don't know what that disease is, it's just it's a crippling disease. It just takes away your body's ability to, to balance and strength, and he's confined to a wheelchair. And so for years, Justin Peters went to these faith healers and seeking healing, thinking that they could heal him. But then he realized that most of them, if not all of them, were frauds. And so then he devoted his ministry to exposing these frauds because they're taking advantage of people. They're taking their money and they're giving a lot of false hope. And so what Peters would do is he would go in his wheelchair or in his crutches to healing crusades and events like Benny Hinn's. And he would try to get to the front and, and request healing because he knew that they couldn't heal him. Because the only people they're bringing up on stage, like I said, are people who have conditions that cannot be seen. So again, you have some kind of inner disease that can't be seen with the naked eye. Well, Peter's has cerebral palsy. It's pretty noticeable. And you know what the bodyguard or the security team would do to Peter's every time he went to an event? They would make sure he stayed in the back. He was not allowed to the stage. And there were lots of people like that. They'd bring their, their sick child or their... You know, their paralyzed husband, and they don't let him on stage. Who do they let on stage? The individuals that they can trick or the ones that they paid. That didn't happen with Jesus. When Jesus came, he really healed people. Listen, people that were quadriplegic, paralyzed from the neck down, walked again. Individuals that had mutilated or deformed body parts were restored. People that had leprosy, meaning they had this skin disease that made them look terrifying. Jesus made it go away. Jesus restored blind people. He made the deaf hear, and most importantly, he raised dead people to new life. The accounts of Jesus' healing ministries is incredible, but there's an element of sadness to them because... As you see here, what do the people want? All they want is physical healing. Here stands in front of them the eternal Son of God who can grant them, like I said, every spiritual blessing, the hope of heaven, reconciliation with God, forgiveness of all their sins. And what do they want? Heal my aching body. Temporary earthly healing. This would be like if you stood before a king and the king said, ask of me whatever you wish and your request was, I'd like dinner tonight. When the king would have granted you a seat at his table in a room in his castle, if you only asked. All the people in this story would get sick again. All the people in this story would die. It's just like when we get sick and get better, it's only temporary. Our healing in this world is only temporary. We will get sick again, and we will die. Every single person that met Jesus on that shore is now dead. And they are either in heaven or they're in hell. And that's why it's important for us to understand that, yes, Jesus showed incredible compassion, but the reason he came was not to heal our bodies, but to save our souls. Luke 19.10, the Son of Man, Jesus, came to seek and to save the lost. 1 Timothy 1.15, here's a trustworthy saying, deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That was his mission, to, to enter into this dark and hostile world. Why? To save rebels from the wrath of God. Of course, you know this one, John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him should, should not perish but have everlasting life. He came for our salvation. He came to save our souls. You say, well, then, then why did he come and heal the bo all these people's bodies? Why did he perform all these healings? I'll give you a few answers, and I think this will help you begin to understand why this is so important. One, Jesus is profoundly compassionate. He is profoundly compassionate. A lot of people want to say he only healed to fulfill the office of the Messiah and fulfill the prophecies. Well, if that were the case, he wouldn't have spent hours doing it. 
He wouldn't have spent all day healing literally every single person that came to him. He, he, it's almost as if Jesus couldn't turn people away. It's almost as if he couldn't say no. And I, I think that that's right because the mercy of God is, is drawn to suffering people. And I think that he stayed there day and night, almost, almost every day he did this. And so when you see Jesus healing people, it's because he cared about them. He loved them. And this is the mercy and compassion of God in Christ. Uh, secondly, he is fulfilling prophecy. The prophet said that the Messiah would do this. They said that he would come and perform these miracles and prove that he is the promised one, that he is the Christ. So this is evidence that he is the one God has sent. But finally, Jesus is healing people because he's giving a picture of the future kingdom. He's trying to show you that this is what it will be like in my father's kingdom. When the fullness of his kingdom arrives on earth, there will be no sickness at all. There will be no death. There will be no disease. There will be no suffering. And so Jesus virtually eradicated disease from Israel. Sickness was gone. And it was a glimpse. It was a picture of when in the future God will dwell with man. Just like in the Garden of Eden, God will be with man. It will be absolute perfection and love and perfect peace and joy. There will be no more death or disease or sin. And Jesus' healing ministry is a foreshadow of that. But here's the deal. And this is what I want you to walk away with. Is that the greatest treasure is not the healings. It's not the, even the kingdom. The greatest treasure is the man who got out of the boat. He's the treasure. Our reward in Christ is Christ. You could walk away from here tonight with a full, full health, wealth, and happiness and live a hundred years. But if you don't have Jesus, what good is it if you die and go to hell? The greatest gift is not the healings, it's the healer. And listen, God loves you so much that he wants to give you what is best for you. And what is best for you is God. The greatest gift God could offer any one of us today is not material blessings or financial status or healing in our body or whatever our earthly carnal desires are. Our greatest need is Jesus. He's our greatest need and he is far better than anything you could think of in this world. And if you're like me, if you're a really good sinner like me who knows how to ruin his life like really, really quick, the things I want are usually the things that destroy me. I have a really good knack at that. I have, I have a really good uh, uh, practice. I've made a pretty good habit of the things I really want in this life are the things that will take me down quicker than anything else. But that is until Christ saved me. Because when Christ saved me, actually the sin that I once loved, I now hate, and the righteousness I once hated, I now love. This, this Jesus... He not only grants eternal life, you know what he does? He changes your heart so that you don't love that sin anymore. You begin to love him. And you begin to see that this is the one that my heart was made for. There's a reason people, every person, is addicted to something. There's a reason we go after the things of the world to fulfill our desires and to try to seek satisfaction in the things of the world. It's because you were made to seek satisfaction. You were made to fulfill your desires. You were made for happiness and joy and pleasure. You just weren't made to find it in sin. That's our problem. The problem is not you desire things. The problem is you desire the wrong thing. The problem is, as C.S. Lewis said, is not that you want happiness. The problem is that you are far too easily pleased. He says, we're like children who are offered a holiday at the sea, and we settle for mud pies in the slums. We're offered eternal joy and satisfaction and pleasure and, and fulfillment and purpose and peace and joy. And what we seek is the world. We seek to be satisfied in lesser things. We're, we're like a man who would take a $1 cheeseburger from McDonald's when he can go eat at Ruth Chris. Because we're satisfied with lesser things. That's why the Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. 
rejoice in the Lord always. The Bible commands us to be joyful and to be glad in Him. Do you know who offers you or promises health, wealth, and happiness? The devil. That's what he offered Jesus. When Jesus was in the garden or when he was in the wilderness, he offered him a way out. He offered him the treasures of the world, the kingdoms of the world. He offered him worldliness. And that's the same thing he offers to you. But Jesus offers something so much better, and that is himself, and, and that is why he came. Our sin has separated us from a holy God and has condemned us in his presence. Christ has come into the world, become like one of us, yet without sin, lives a perfectly holy and righteous life, obeying all the commands of his Father, and then willingly choosing the cross. The purpose of the cross was for the Son of God to be beaten and tortured and ridiculed and laid down on that rugged piece of wood upon which he was nailed, lifted up, and suffer so that our sins could be paid for. So that he could die in our place. And why would he do that? Well, Peter tells us, listen to this. Christ suffered once for sins. The righteous for the unrighteous. Why? That he might bring us to God. Christ died so you could have God. Not just so you could go to heaven. Not just so you your sins could be forgiven. Christ died so you could have God. The greatest fulfillment in your life is God himself. And until you come to terms with the fact that nothing is going to satisfy you in the world except for Jesus, then you are going to be empty, you are going to be wanting, you are going to be looking, and you are going to come up short every single time. And so if Jesus was standing before you and you had one opportunity, what do you want from the Lord? What do you want? What does your heart desire? Is it earthly things? Or is it the one for whom you're made? Father, we thank you that you have given us the greatest treasure in your son. We thank you, God, that we have the opportunity to know you through him. Apart from him, we have no good. And Lord, I just pray that you would begin to put a bitter taste in our mouth for worldly things, for sinful things, so that we would not desire them over you. And I pray that we would be able to each day taste and see that the Lord is good. And that you have in our, in, in your mind and in your heart, our, our best interest. And that is to not have the benefit, but the benefactor. The one who gives, Lord, of himself to us. And I pray that we, God would be consumed with you. And I pray tonight, Lord, that the, the veil would be taken away from eyes who can't see. And that ears that are deaf, Lord, would be able to hear and understand to renew hearts so that our desires are aligned with righteous and holy longings. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be dismissed here. Class, our ladies want to be dismissed first. If you're new here tonight, we welcome you. If you're joining a class new here, then go with Miss.